Good evening, everybody. Lovely to meet you all. Uh, my name's Hayley. Um, I'm from the Plymouth Marine Laboratory. My details here if you want to find me on Twitter. I'll be tweeting lots over this weekend and taking some pictures of you guys. So, look forward to meeting you all on there. So, let's kick off. I'm a marine earth, obs earth observation scientist, so I work with data that comes from the satellites that are operated from this room behind us here. Um, as I said before, I work at the Plymouth Marine Laboratory, right next to the sea, but I'm actually working quite a lot at the moment with you, Metsat, and the team here on marine applications, particularly for the new data that we're getting through the Copernicus program, which you're going to hear a lot more about from the other speakers. So my areas of interest in particular are ocean colour data. You'll hear a lot about that. It's just one of the types of data that we're going to be looking at over this weekend. I'm interested in validating that data, so taking measurements in the sea and checking how the satellite's performing, making sure they're as accurate as possible. I like to develop algorithms so that we can pull from different bits of information out of that data, particularly for applications such as these, HABs, harmful algal blooms, looking at ocean carbon content. I also like to do some model validation, so bringing in a climate perspective. And also quite a big passion for training in science communication. If you took a, take the recent MOOC that you met, that did, you might have seen me in that with a slightly different haircut. Um, and yeah, I'm just generally really interested in science communication. And sometimes you'll find me doing slightly ridiculous things like making a version of Sentinel 3 out of cake or uh, actually dressing as a dead satellite for Halloween. Um, it's a little embarrassing when somebody else turned up in the same costume. So um, these are the sorts of things you'll find me doing. So a few things I think that we should all know about the ocean and I want to give you these ideas as some inspiration for what we're going to work on this weekend with the data. So the first thing about the ocean is it stores heat and this heat storage is really important for a number of reasons. We're in New Metsat, we have a lot of meteorological satellites here and the ocean plays a role in what happens with our weather. It also has a role in our climate. The ocean is a big storage of heat and how much heat it's storing in different places is a big part of what's going to happen under future climate change scenarios and indeed under past climate change that's happened naturally. But it's not just limited to sort of these physical kind of parameters in our earth. The ocean's heat storage also has an influence on land-based ecosystems. This is a, an example that's particularly close to my heart. I actually did my PhD in that little bay just at the bottom there um, on this coastline, slightly further south than this, but this coastline. Um, and these are two places. So this is Namibia. This is Mozambique. And these two places are actually on the same line of latitude across here. So they receive pretty much the same amount of sunlight. So you'd think they'd have similar climates and they'd look quite similar. But because of the differences in the ocean here and how much heat is stored, you have completely different ecosystems on the land. In this case, in Namibia, you have a very cold ocean, which means you don't get a lot of heat evaporating, taking water with it and causing rain. You have a very, very dry desert ecosystem there. On the other side, the water's much warmer, so you get a lot more rain and you get these beautiful like mangroves and rainforest ecosystems. It's much nicer to swim and dive on this side as well. Second thing you should know about the ocean is that it moves, and it moves in a lot of different ways. So you'll hear quite a bit um, over the next couple of talks about this product called altimetry, and that's mostly involved in how the ocean moves. That's one of the ways we can tell how it moves from satellite. So what ways does the ocean move? Well, it's the level of the ocean changes, the height of it. And you may have heard about the recent sea level rise that's happened and is predicted to continue under climate change. We can use satellite data to look at that and we'll see more about that in a minute. The ocean also has lots of currents. So that heat I was talking about, the ocean redistributes that heat through currents. And that heat actually drives some of these currents as well. So you can see here, these different patterns here. I live up here, in the very south of the UK. It's much, much warmer than the same latitude across towards Canada and North America here because of this warm current, the Gulf Stream comes across. So currents can be really important as well. The ocean also moves on much shorter time scales. So here we've got an example of a storm surge. It's an event that happens quite quickly, causes a lot of damage, a natural disaster. On a more fun side, for some people, <laughs> you get these massive waves that come through the ocean as well. And these are really important to know about. It's good if you're a surfer, probably not so good if you're a ship. The last thing I think you should know about the ocean is that it's alive. It's absolutely rich with life. So my personal favorite thing in the ocean is these little guys, phytoplankton. These tiny little microscopic plant-like creatures, they photosynthesize, they take in sunlight. They're the base of the marine food chain. Pretty much all marine life, other than stuff that lives in a very deep ocean, relies on these guys. And so do we, because they provide about half of the oxygen that we breathe. And they're quite incredible. They really are diverse and interesting, and they actually change the color of the ocean, which is how we're able to see them from space. They also have a role in the carbon cycle, so linking back to that climate change story I was talking about, 
They absorb carbon, they also affect the ocean pH, which is linked in there. And it moves beyond phytoplankton as well. It's not just them in the ocean. They feed down to a whole bunch of other life. So some of that we rely on. I like to eat fish, I like to eat shellfish, I'm sure a lot of you guys do as well. It's because of these guys that we're able to get the sorts of resources that we rely on, the jobs that supply people with income and things like that. And then there's also the rest of the biodiversity in the ocean. I love to scuba dive, and the ocean has an amazing array of biodiversity. Here's just an example of a beautiful coral reef, but there's all sorts of different things living in the oceans. Okay, so the most important thing for me is that actually all these different features of the ocean, the heat, circulation, the life in it, we can observe using satellite-based platforms. In terms of heat, we can look at sea surface temperature, as I mentioned before, for circulation and how the ocean moves, we can look at altimetry. And the life in the ocean is very intimately connected to the colour of it, through those phytoplankton, the little tiny creatures I was telling you about. And, I mean, my background is I'm a marine scientist, so I didn't actually start working with satellite data, I started learning about what was in the ocean, how it worked, the life and things like that. So satellites have brought a lot to my field in the last what, 20 or so years, and even more so now. It's an exponential growth we've seen in the use of this data in marine science. And they're useful to us for a number of reasons. Uh, one particularly important one is the spatial and temporal coverage. I think I once heard uh, an analogy that we have more data in one satellite swath, so one time it goes around and takes a set of images, than more, more data than all the ships have ever collected that have gone out on cruise. And we're getting that data now daily. It's, you know, it's a real change in how we're able to observe the ocean. And that means we can look at different spatial and temporal scales, from the smaller scale to the entire globe. And we can look daily, weekly, monthly, and over long time periods, which I'll talk more about in a minute. And we can use synergy. So we've got different, different satellites producing different types of data. And a lot of these problems and things that we're interested in in the ocean, they need different types of data to be brought together. And hopefully that's where you guys come in a bit this weekend. So we can use these synergistically. But things like climate long time series is really important. If you want to prove that the Earth is warming up, you need a long record to show that's what's happening. And thanks to programs like Copernicus, which is where a lot of this data behind us is now going, um, we're able to start getting these long time series and growing them continually. And the data, importantly, is open and free. So scientists like me all around the world can use it to understand the ocean better. So some application examples for you. I'm hoping this will give you a bit of a taste of the sorts of things we can do with this data. Uh, we can understand and predict some storms. So this is an example of um, some, this is a sea surface temperature image and wind speeds first over here as well on this image. And you can see this is a path of Hurricane Katrina. And the sea surface temperature has a strong influence on how hurricanes form, how strong they are, and things like that. So linking those data types together, here for example, you can see how the temperature influences the uh, strength of the storms over time. We can link sea surface temperature data with other types of data, though. So a couple of my colleagues are very keen surfers, and I, I think, you know, this was, it was work, they said, right? But um, I think they just wanted a good excuse to go surfing for the day. So they came up with this really cool project where they were interested in finding out what happens with the sea surface temperature very close to the coast. Often our satellites would only look over, say, a one kilometre square patch, and they wanted to know what's going on in higher resolution. But they were also able to use this platform they created with temperature loggers on the surfboards to validate the satellite data. So they were taking two different types of data, bringing them together to understand how they interrelate at different spatial and temporal scales. Some other work that's been done with SST, this is by another colleague of mine, um, is taking sea surface temperature here and looking at these very sharp gradients. You see where it goes from very blue here to red. These are what they call frontal systems. And you match these, you can see these lines all relate to these different gradients in the sea surface temperature. And one interesting thing they found when they compared this data with data from tagged animals such as basking sharks and gannets is that these creatures congregate in these areas because it's where their food is. So they've then taken this a step further. So I mean, that's interesting in itself, but you can actually start using this information to plan how you're going to manage the marine environment. So one of the things they've been looking at here is where you could put marine protected areas. So if these guys are feeding all around this frontal system here, for example, maybe that's a good place to put a marine protected area because that's where they're going to be most of the time. Similarly, you can start making trade-offs. Should we put a, um, a new wind farm in? Where should we put that in relation to these fronts and where these guys are dependent on for their food systems? So moving on from SST, let's have a little bit of a look at altimetry. Altimetry is all about the height of the ocean, and it can tell us lots of different things. So in this case here, that data has been used for surf and storm observations and forecasts. 
So in this case, you're looking at a cyclone that's come in, and then you're looking at the, this is the relative uh, water level as the storm surge has come into shore. So we can understand how these sort of cyclones are going to impact people living in this area. On the more plus side, if you're a surfer, you might want to know when these sorts of waves, probably not from a cyclone, but when waves and things are going to be coming in. So you can combine altimetry information with other things um, through projects like this. So that's buoy data, models, um, weather models are in there as well to predict when you're going to have the best waves for surfing. On the other side of that again, if you're a ship or you're an oil platform, you probably want to avoid waves. So you can use these sorts of information here, also derived from altimetry. This is a significant wave height product to say where you should be taking your ships, which routes, or maybe where you do or don't want to put your oil platforms. You can also use it to look at things that aren't just the water. You can also look at ice using altimetry. So this is a really interesting example where altimetry was used to pick up these big icebergs. And they managed to look at the height of them and the thickness, and then uh, map and model how they melted over time, and also to track them through the oceans. So again, for a ship, this is probably something you might want to avoid. Um, but it's also interesting from a climate perspective and how ice is melting and changing in the world. You can also use currents derived from altimetry. This is a really interesting example from quite recent, actually, where um, everyone's heard of probably MH370, the flight that went down, predicted somewhere around this area. So the satellite data was useful in a number of ways. The currents could be used to figure out, OK, if we think it crashed somewhere around here, where do we think the debris from it is going to be transported to? And where should we start looking for it to start figuring out what's going on? And you can also use that in a reverse way. So if you find debris, I think, I think they did over here, I think this is where they found it, you can actually backtrack the trajectory to see where the plane actually went down. And this sort of principle can work for other things as well. It's not just debris related to penny plane crashes, it could also be pollutants. Um, things like plastics in the ocean are a particular topic of interest in this regard at the moment. This is my favorite area for some of my work. So I work with ocean color data. It is what it says on the tin. Um, is the ocean blue? Is it green? Is it red? Is it somewhere in between? And from that information, we can tell a lot about the phytoplankton that I mentioned before. So this is some of the field work that I did during my PhD. And actually, I just leant over the, into the boat and scooped this water up, and that was the color it was. Um, and this is a red tide phenomenon, a harmful algal bloom that you get to the west coast of South Africa. And this is an interesting phenomenon, not just looking interesting, but actually it can be quite dangerous. Um, if you eat shellfish from this water, it could potentially be contaminated with toxins. It's completely natural. This happens normally. But it's something that people who are farming shellfish and fishing along this coast want to know about. So they don't get sick, so they don't lose money, and those sorts of things. And we can look at it from satellites. So here's an image of one of these sort of blooms coming down the coast here. This is just a chlorophyll product, an estimate of the amount of biomass that's in the water. This is a slightly different approach that some of my colleagues have developed, where they're looking at different shades of the colour in the ocean to map whether there's a risk of harmful species being involved. So it's not just the biomass that we're interested in when it comes to phytoplankton. We're also interested in carbon. And this is some work we've been doing, taking those estimates of chlorophyll and looking at how we can convert that to an estimate of carbon. So we can understand how much carbon the ocean is taking up and figure that into our climate models. Some other examples, moving away from the base of the food chain, you can look at fisheries. This is some interesting work that's been going on in India, and they've been taking this chlorophyll but also sea surface temperature data and looking at where the best potential fishing zones would be. And the idea is this, they can help fishermen to manage where they're going better, they can make the process more efficient, they can target certain areas rather than you know, maybe causing more damage to trawling or picking up lots of fish from whole areas of the coastline. Another ecosystem we can look at is reefs. So this is an area in uh, Puerto Rico where there's lots of coral reefs. This is uh, some NOAA projects that have been done on this area. And this is not a chlorophyll product, as, as is, you can see here. This is actually um, a different parameter that we get from ocean color satellites. It's uh, called the diffuse attenuation coefficient. And basically what it means is how much light is getting down into the ocean. And if you're a coral reef, you have these little zooxanthellae creatures that live in you. You need to photosynthesize to live. Um, so if the water is full of stuff and there's not much light getting down, it's not good for your health. And this can happen naturally, changes in the stability of the water and how much light is getting down, but it can also happen as a result of human activities, that that sort of thing changes. Um, you may have heard about the problems with dredging and the Great Barrier Reef. So using these sorts of images, we can monitor and manage those sorts of impacts on reefs. Okay, so some take-home messages for you guys from me. Is I'd like you to, hopefully you understand what you've seen from what I've said, is that you know, all aspects of the ocean are interlinked. Um, heat energy drives ocean currents, it influences sea levels. Um, the heat and the movement of the ocean also create the environments in which ocean life has evolved and which it continues to live. So they're very dependent on all these different connected factors. 
And you know, these examples have already shown quite a few examples of um, synergy. So fronts using sea surface temperature, also linking GPS tags in terms of storms, you're looking at maybe wind data as well as um, temperature data, fishing zones, sea surface temperature and chlorophyll. And all these data can be put into models as well to enhance how we use them. But it's not just satellite data that can synergize with there's other things as well. The GPS tags I mentioned. And there's also a growing community looking at citizen observations and how we can bring in measurements that people are making every day to understand our satellite data. So things to think about. I think data is really beautiful. I love looking at these images. I never get bored of it. And you always spot something new when you're looking at a global image of chlorophyll, some new pattern that's going on, some new part of a current that you haven't picked up before. Um, and so I think that's you know, it's something that sells this data really well so people get some interested in it. And hopefully that's something you guys can have a look at over the course of the hackathon. But it's not always easily accessible. Um, you have to be a relatively good programmer to get to some of this data, but it could be useful for many, many more people. So if we can make that easier for them, more scientists can use it, or businesses can use it, lots of people can benefit from this huge amount of data we're now getting. So I ask you to have a think about how you can make it accessible and what new connections can you see between the data. I'm here all weekend. Um, I'm happy to help as much as I can. Um, obviously, I'm not an expert in all these different areas of satellite data, just mostly ocean color, but I'll help with whatever I can and point you in the right direction if I can't. So thank you very much. Looking forward to the weekend.